Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jalen and today I'm going over all of the books that I read in September. So full candor, I truly tried to film this video three times now and I either got interrupted, couldn't speak at all. <laughs> I was just rambling about shit, um, but I think I have time to do it now. I'm actually going on a work trip this week, tomorrow, and then I'm extending it and going to New York for two days. And I'm so excited about it. I haven't been to New York since I was a teenager. And so I'm planning to maybe do a reading vlog. I want to go to like five or six bookstores, eat a lot of food, quickly like run through the bookstores, pick up some stuff. I recently asked for some recommendations based on like my favorite shelf on Instagram. And you guys submitted some stuff that I hadn't even heard about before that all sounds so good. So I made a list. I'm going to try to find them. And I think I'm going to try to vlog that experience. So if you are interested in a vlog, a New York City vlog, let me know and I will try to do that. But anyways, yeah, so September, in terms of books, was a lot of podcast reading. All books that I already wanted to read, but I booked a lot of author interviews to come October and November, and it's been so exciting just to have the author response of coming on my channel, and having authors be, be so kind. It's really made my dreams come true of being able to have an author podcast, and originally I planned on having it be both like an author interview and bookish content creator podcast. But as of right now, I think it's leaning more into like pure author interviews. That could change. I'm still trying to figure out how I want to do like other chatty style videos. Maybe just do bonus episodes like every other week or something. Not sure about that. Anyways, yeah, I wanted to get into the books that I read and I'm enjoying a glass of wine as well. I'm bringing the booze back to the bar in the bookcase, baby. See, so yeah, I'm taking it back to my roots, baby. Having some booze, talking about books. Then I gotta go pack. So let's get into these books. Hmm. That is bomb too. It's a Justin Cabernet Sauve. So the first two books that I read this month were for a reading blog. I wanted to challenge myself and see if I could, I could, but see if I would like authors that I didn't like reading about a year or two ago. So those two authors were Jenny Offal and Catherine Lacey. So I read Department of Speculation last year, early 2021, and truly disliked that book. I had a really bad experience reading it. I was waiting for it to be over and it was a very short book. I found that the fragmentary style of it was kind of confusing and I just didn't love the form of it and I thought it just felt a little bit gimmicky. I had previously read Weather by Jenny Offal back in 2020 before COVID, before Booktube, any of that. And I remember liking it, but also similarly being confused by it and then telling myself I liked it more than I did because people I saw talking about it were incredibly smart and I thought that it was just smart, but <laughs> upon reflection upon reading Department of Speculation, I was like, maybe I just didn't like it. Um, so I wanted to go back and reread Weather, and I did, and I feel similarly to it, but I think I have a better understanding of what I dislike about her work, and it was just really fun trying something again. And I implore you all to try this for an author that you're still like intrigued by, but didn't really like one of their works, like either reread that book or try another one by them if you're still interested in their work, you might surprise yourself because I really did with both of these authors, more so with Catherine Lacey than Jenny Offal. But so getting into weather, this is a piece of climate fiction that follows this woman named Lizzie, who is a mother and a wife, and she has a brother who is recovering, a recovering addict. And the book follows her as she's thinking about climate change in the present moment following Trump's presidency. So it's very much in her head, a stream of consciousness, thinking about all these questions. And starts working with her prior mentor who runs this podcast that is talking about sort of end times, climate change, all these things. And she starts fielding questions that are submitted to the podcast. And overall, I really loved how Jenny Offal explores climate change and these very present topics through the sort of spliced narrative of a fragmentary structure, sort of replicating the a kind of loose mind of someone that is thinking about all these things and constant changes and all of this. Um, but I will say that I do think that the form of fragmentary structure generally just doesn't work for me often because sometimes like the connective tissue between the fragments just doesn't congeal for me. I'm not sure what she's trying to get at sometimes. And I think she does this when she's attempting humor. Sometimes it is funny. Sometimes when it's clear what she's doing, I really like it. I like when she has very observational insights about all of these things. I, I find it very relatable often in her writing, but I will say sometimes it seems like she's kind of swinging for the fences and it doesn't really land for me. And that is wholly, I think, in part to the fragmentary structure. If you're trying to condense an idea or a thought into one or two lines on its own, but also keeping it connected to a narrative in a novel, I think sometimes it can just fall flat, for me at least as a reader. So I think I will read more Jenny Offal in the future. I would love to try another of hers, like her next book, whenever that's published. 
but she tends to publish every like six years, I want to say. So it'll probably be some time until that book. But I would like to try again and see what she does next and see if it pays off better because I like this more than I thought I would, but I still have problems with it. And then for Catherine Lacey, I read Pew right when I started doing booktube and I really disliked the idea or the reading of a passive narrator. So we follow this person named Pew who wakes up on a church pew and is discovered by this family. And Pew does not have any identifiable race, age, gender, etc. So the people in this town, it's a very conservative southern town, very religious, they all start imprinting themselves upon Pew and start telling them about their experiences, their secrets, trying to get Pew to say something about their identity. And Pew never does. They are mostly mute throughout this novel. There are a couple times when they say something, but it's usually in situations in which someone understands what Pew is in terms of their identity or their questioning of themselves. And so overall, when I first read this book, I really disliked how by the end of it, it seemed to be leading up to something coming, something dark. I saw some comparisons to Shirley Jackson, and so I was thinking it was going to be sort of like the lottery-esque. And it doesn't really have that sort of payoff. But what I really loved about this book is that it still has this sort of creepy atmosphere that I think is attributable to Shirley Jackson's work. But what I love so much is, is that she really is a, a novelist who is obsessed with ideas and philosophical questions and trying to find a narrative structure to explore those things without giving you like a purely plotty novel or just a purely sort of esoteric philosophical novel as well. I think she blends the idea novel with the plotty novel really, really well. I should say I reread Pew after I read The Answers. So let me backtrack. I read the answers in response to my response to Pew. So that was what I read first. And I loved the answers so much that I went and read Pew after it as a reread. So it was kind of like extension of that vlog. So let me get into the answers as well. On a very similar note, very different novel, but in this book, she follows a woman in New York who is suffering from chronic pain. And she's going to these various treatments trying to figure out how to solve her pain. And she ends up finding one that does work, but it's incredibly expensive. And so she starts looking on Craigslist for some jobs. And there's this guy who was like an A-list celebrity. I kind of thought of him as like a Taylor Swift adjacent celebrity, but male and an actor. But he is doing this experiment with this company, I believe, who is enlisting a bunch of women to play a different role for this man. So a different kind of girlfriend, whether it's a maternal girlfriend, an emotional girlfriend, the sexual girlfriend, the girlfriend that fights with him, they all have their own roles to play and they're getting paid for this. And then once they fulfill that role, they go home, live their own life. And so all of this, this amalgamation of girlfriends is supposed to replicate the perfect love. And so this book, similarly to Pew, really is exploring a central question. And in the answers, I think it's about love. And in Pew, it's all about identity. And, but both of these things, both these novels are really about identity at the end of the day, I think. So while Mary is embarking on this journey with this man and this job and trying to resolve her chronic pain. She's also considering her own trauma and her familial history, thinking about all of these questions as well, which is really intriguing. So but what I love the most about this book is Catherine Lacey's writing. I love her brain seems very similar to mine. I love when I find writers that I feel like think in a similar way to me. Like, for example, she reminds me a lot of like Sheila Hetty and how she thinks on the page is similar to how I think. Very like relatable, I guess. And that's why I think I love their work so much. But I also love how they structure their novels and are so just obsessed with rooting themselves in ideas. So I think in both Pew and The Answers, there's not like a clean, a purely clean resolution to either novel in a traditional sense, but I loved how they wrapped upon thinking about these no novels now, as opposed to like two years ago when I read Pew and didn't really know what to think of like the passive voice of that. But yeah, so I loved both of these books. The Answers in particular became a new favorite of mine. It's on my favorite shelves now. And it was just so fun to discover an author or rediscover an author that I thought I wouldn't really vibe with. And I really ended up loving her and her work. And actually, I just got a proof of her new book called The Biography of X, which is coming out in March 2023 and I cannot wait. I flip through it and it seems to play with form as well and seems really interesting in terms of like it has a bunch of footnotes. That's why I'm saying that. So I'm really curious to see how that one lands for me. But overall, if you have any recommendations for authors like similar to Catherine Lacey or Sheila Hetty, I would love to hear those because it was a great discovery. So that project went really well in terms of me finding a new author that I'm obsessed with. So that is that. And so next up, I read A Deep Cut of Iris Murdoch. This is my first Iris Murdoch novel. I own a few of hers now, but it's A Severed Head. 
And it was really fun just like diving into an author with the book that really screamed to me the most. I heard that this one is very much just like a messy love entanglement drama. And that is very much the case. This book is so odd, very like straightforward, but odd in its telling. And I don't know if it's just a factor of it being like an older work and I'm not used to reading that many sort of like backlist titles, I guess. But I really enjoyed how this one suspends realism and just plays with the, the characters in this book. Iris Murdoch just seems to be having so much fun with the mess that is this novel that was just such a blast to read. And it seems like she's very, or she is very aware of the humor and these dynamics and how she explores love philosophically in a similar way to Catherine Lacey, but I think even more humorous, I would say. This book follows a man who's cheating on his wife and he later learns that his wife is also cheating on him and then she leaves him abruptly. And so that kind of subverts his expectations. He's a very selfish person. And then he ends up thinking about his mistress. He ends up falling out of love with her as one might expect. He is trash. <laughs> and so this book, all of these characters in this book, they end up falling in love with each other in different ways, having sex with each other. There's an incest moment in this book. And what it's doing is it's, it's sort of shifting the paradigm with each dynamic in this book. And Iris Murdoch is like, okay, if I have these two characters fall in love, what will happen? And then if I make them switch lovers again, what will happen? And it's just really fun to see how that plays out. And to me, the tone of this book reminded me a lot of the movie Clue from like the 80s in terms of its sort of like semi-darkness, but also just like humor underlying the entire situation and being very self-aware in it. But there's no murder mystery. It's more so just about like the weirdness of this love entanglement messiness that's going on. But there are also some really dark and weird scenes. Like one of the characters that's in this dynamic, she is sort of like a demonic presence in terms of like how she reads a situation and the main character, how she's really incisive towards him, but like her manner is very like demonic and ominous and weird. And she's like the only character that's like that. Like this book is just odd, but so fun on every page. And it was weird though, because like when I was reading this book, it's a very slim book. It's like under 200 pages, but I found myself having a hard time like finishing it for some reason. I was really enjoying it, but I do think that this novel is a little bit long for what it is. Um, I found myself sort of like straying away from it, but also being excited to pick it up again, which is really interesting. So yeah, that's that one. If you want something that's like, I guess, from a contemporary lens, like more Sally Rooney-ish, but make it more messy, older, and just like odd, but really fun and like more humorous, I would try this one. It was really good. And I'm curious to read more of Iris Murdoch because she seems like an, a novelist that I'm really going to enjoy other works of too. So yeah, that's that one. Next up, I read Devil House by John Darnielle. This is a metafictional novel about the creation of true crime and really a critique of the true crime genre generally. So we follow this guy who's in this house called Devil House, and he is trying to write a new book of true crime about the murders that occurred at Devil House. And so from there, we see the structure of the book is told in seven parts. And the first and seventh part, the second and sixth, and the third and fifth sort of mirror each other and are focused on different different stories of true crime that all kind of come together in this one narrative. And then the middle part, the fourth part, is a standalone, odd, older section that'll let you discover on your own. But what this book eventually reveals itself to be is this critique of true crime and thinking about when we tell stories about crimes that have really happened or allegedly happened or anything that touches people in real life and try to narrativize it, how does that impact those people? And what is the sort of ethics of writing it. Should we write it? Is there a value to true crime? Should we just embrace any true crime narrative as purely fiction? Or is the fact that it's based in some truth make it a sticky area to not write in? And the book really explores this in a very nuanced way. And I think if you've been kind of following the discourse around the Dahmer Netflix adaptation, I've been thinking a lot about true crime generally. And I think it's just a really interesting, rich area to discuss in terms of like debate and thinking about the morals around true crime. And so, yeah, this book is not really horror specifically, but there's a lot of like, you know, grisly depictions of violence in this book. And overall, it's quite dark, but I really loved how critical it was of true crime and thinking about the form itself as a novel and like thinking about if you're trying to critique true crime in a novel form, like what does that mean as well? Like that's what this novel is. But then in each part, it also isolates the inquiry as well. And I really like it the more that I think about it. So yeah, I recommend that one for spooky season as well. It's not like direct horror, but if you like metafiction or like thinking about true crime and that sounds interesting, I would recommend it as well. Okay, now getting into the podcast of it all. I had a bunch of authors on my channel or I recorded a bunch of podcasts for the channel over the last like two weeks. And the first one I have is The Rabbit Hutch by Tess Gunty. This book was just long listed for the National Book Award and 
I love this book so much, and my discussion with Tess was so like revelatory for me. She's so kind. Her answers were incredible. She's on straight up like genius mode, <laughs> like the entire interview. I was a little intimidated like reading this book. I knew she was on genius mode, and then meeting her, she's like truly on genius mode, and it was just a joy to be able to talk to her about her book, and she was just so kind. But anyways, getting into the actual book, this book follows a young 18-year-old named Blondine. She She's living in a Midwestern fictional town called Vacaville, Indiana. And this book is polyphonic, so we meet a bunch of different characters, sometimes for brief moments, very fleeting moments with certain characters, but they're all connected by the setting of Vacaville, and more specifically, by the apartment building at the core of this novel, which is the Rabbit Hutch. And so Blondine, she's living with three other boys. They've all recently aged out of the foster care system. And upon the novel's opening, we learn that an act of violence is being committed against Blondine, but it's sort of vague, a little bit confusing. You're not really sure what is going on in that scene. And as the novel progresses, we learn more about Blondine and her past, but not really too much about her like youth. It's more so about this one dynamic that she has with a teacher of hers that was abusive. And then we meet a bunch of other characters, all leading up to this event that's occurring against Blondine. But in terms of what thematically what this book is looking at is looking about power and thinking of transcendence. Using the polyphonic form of this novel, Tess Conti seems to be exploring the potential for kind of escaping forms that we know. In Blondine, she is incredibly intelligent. She is obsessed with female mystics, and she's thinking about life on a very macro level while kind of countering that with some of the more micro and specific acts of violence that have occurred against her and sort of reckoning all those things in the novel form. And so there's so many like mini stories in here of other characters that all kind of tie into this idea of transcendence. And I thought this book was so fucking smart. It's so big brained, but also it reminded me a lot of two, well, one of my favorite novels and one of my favorite writers, namely Middle March by George Eliot and then Jonathan Franzen. I think if you liked either that book or that author, some of what she's doing here is very similar to that. And I just love that the idea of using a certain structure in the novel, whether it be a location or a family to consider what the novel can do and I think more so in terms of Middlemarch how George Eliot uses the city of Middlemarch to explore all these different voices within it contrasted with the more specific aspects of Blondine's past is similar to Jonathan Franzen so it's like a perfect melding of my interests which I love so much so if you want to hear more about that I will link my discussion with Tesconti below I highly recommend it it's spoiler free as well so if you want to get a feel for it and highly recommend checking that out too Okay, next up, I had another author interview, and it was for Andrew Sean Greer, author of Less, which won the 2018 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. I don't know how I got him on my channel. I'm still shook over it, but it was for his new book that came out, a sequel to Less, called Less is Lost. So I kind of missed the discourse around Less when it won the prize back in 2018 because I was not reading at the time. I was in law school and just not really focused on that. But um, it was really fun to read both of these books back to back, and it was really nice to read a book that uses like immense humor and levity in its telling to really get at some very deep philosophical questions about identity and being queer and aging and thinking about love. I feel like a lot of books that I read this month were about love, <laughs> um, and I love reading about that. I feel like it's not a focus particularly of a lot of fiction I read of late, but I really enjoyed it. These two books follow Arthur Less. He's middle-aged, and it follows him in both novels on two different journeys. One is across the world in various countries in which he's trying to avoid the reality of his ex marrying a new person. And then the second book, I won't spoil too much because it kind of ties to the first book, but he goes on another journey across America, which makes him consider his privilege and the country that he lives in and thinking about his identity in that way. Um, so less about love, but there's still more love there as well. Um, these books are really fun to read. They're very breezy and light. I guess they're light in their tone, but there's a lot of depth to these books that I really enjoyed. And I think Arthur Lass is just inherently a lovable, if flawed character. I loved hearing Andrew Sean Greer talk about his experience crafting Arthur Lass and him coming back to him for the sequel and thinking about character as a structure for a writer. That was really fun to talk to him about that. And he's just a joy to chat with. So I'll link that one below as well. And yeah, it was really fun catching up on the Lass discourse. Okay, three more books. Next up, I read Sula by Toni Morrison. And this one became a new favorite of mine as well. This is my first fiction Morrison, and I'm a little scared to read more because I feel like nothing's gonna live up to this novel. Like this novel is so good, and in my opinion, it it's giving horror. Like I feel like this is a perfect spooky season read as well. Not really, its content is horrific at times, but I, I say that more so in terms of its tone and its atmosphere and the way that she characterizes Sula in particular. 
really got under my skin at times and it was just really creepy and sort of lingered in my head while I was reading it when I was away from the book and then also after finishing it I've just been thinking about this narrative and these characters so much I'll just give a high level description there's so much going on in this book but the novel opens on her exploring this town called the bottom and its residents but then more specifically we learn about Nell and Sula who are two childhood best friends and the various tragedies that ensue in their lives and how they sort of come together and apart and ultimately this book is considering femininity and sex and thinking about family and inheritance and trauma in that area and what I love so much about this book is that there's so many scenes in here that I will never forget there's one in which Sula she cuts off the tip of her finger to scare some boys away who are threatening to hurt her and Nell. And that image of her just cutting off her finger to make a statement was just so stark in my mind. Also, there's a scene in which Nell and Sula do something together that shocked me. I'll leave it as a surprise. And then another scene, two more scenes, with one in which, oh, there's, okay, there's many, th there's many scenes in this book that I keep thinking about. Um, but just in terms of how Sula considers violence in this book and then how she sort of depicted as this sort of malevolent presence is intentionally playing into how the town thinks of her as a novel progresses but also just the way that Toni Morrison kind of writes the complexity of her character and why she kind of has this stoicism to her is really nuanced and really interesting but there's still some times when like the her play into like the evilness of Sula or the projection of that from the town on her was really interesting to read um, there's this one line if you've read this book you probably remember this but it's when Sula is watching something happen to someone and it says that she is not really like horrified by it, but she's looking at it with interest, which when you learn what she's looking at with interest was really, it fucked me up for lack of a better word. <laughs> and then I also think this book has one of the best death scenes I've ever read in my life. Like blew me away. Toni Morrison is fucking genius mode, like to the max. And I can't wait to read more of hers. I love this so much and I can't recommend it enough. Truly. It was f fucking phenomenal. And and then the last two I have, so the next one is another author podcast that's coming in November. It's Aesthetica by Ali Robottom. This book does not pub until late November, and so I'm saving the conversation till then. But this book and the conversation I had with Ali was so good and so, it really challenged me as a reader to thinking about social media and being on booktube and just thinking about how the internet rots our brain in certain ways. Um, this book follows a influencer who is in her 30s thinking back on her life. So this book is set in the future. And she's considering undergoing this procedure called Aesthetica, which will reverse all of her plastic surgery and make her look as she would as if she had never had any plastic surgery, but it's risky. So she's sitting in a hotel, she's gonna do it the next morning, and she's thinking about her life and how she got here. And in that thinking, she's thinking about a couple dynamics, one being with her mother, another with a sister, like best friend dynamic, and then one with this man named Jake, who in the present timeline, a reporter is asking her to talk about because there's like a Me Too style uh, plot that's going on as well in terms of her coming forward to help women if she tells the truth about what happened to her and how her ascent to like Instagram celebrity was attributable to him but he also abused her as well and so this book is exploring all those dynamics and how she's thinking about now whether she wants to elect another procedure even though it's going to reverse the past procedures it's still another procedure of hers and so she's thinking about why she did what she did thinking about those dynamics and really holding a mirror up to herself and thinking about her life and social media. And so this book was a romp in terms of like it being so plotty and jumping back and forth in its narratives from her as a 19 year old and then in the present and how she kind of got where she is. And so when I picked this up, I could not put it down. It's really a scathing commentary on social media and the sort of malevolent presence of social media in our brains and thinking about the impacts of it on us. And I think it was just a really interesting piece of fiction that I haven't really seen these ideas explored in fiction so directly like I'm kind of surprised by it and maybe I'm just missing some works of late but I really enjoyed how directly Ali Robottom is thinking about these questions in a narrative that is just unputdownable and very pacey but also her writing is great she has a lot of really incredible insights about social media and how she thinks about it through this character and this dynamic was so smart and then also just the use of aesthetica as this fictional procedure that can reverse plastic surgery and thinking about having that option like what would that mean for people as like another procedure like what when does it end you know I really love this book in terms of its exploration of all that and it's a book I keep thinking about too so yeah that's Aesthetica keep an eye out for that book coming out in November and then also our discussion it was so great and the last book I read was for my local book club I had like two days until book club was coming and I hadn't picked this book up yet I've had it on my shelf for like two months 
It's a book I wanted to read for a while. It's Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. Very buzzy. It's been everywhere, like on Bookstagram and stuff. I've been seeing everyone talk about this book. And it sounded really good, but I was like, I don't know if I can get through a 400-page book in two days before book club. And when I tell you I finished this book with five minutes to spare <laughs> before book club, I was enraptured by this book. It's truly like good plot, good writing about platonic friendship over the course of their lives, these two characters and how they develop video games together and how their friendship sort of falls apart at times, but always stays together. This book is just a really good story, really well told in terms of how Gabrielle Zevin uses video games and development of video games, which I love. I grew up being a gamer. I don't play as much as I would like to, but I still, I have consoles. I play sometimes. And it was really cool to see how she uses the novel form and like creating her own novel to explore this friendship through the connective tie of developing video games together and being able to like render on the page what a video game feels like. And then also like taking it removed from there, also like how development of that will tie two people together in the pursuit of art and creativity and the hindrances and the various challenges of doing that, how that can put pressure on a friendship, particularly in this time. I think this book starts in like the 80s or early 90s. I'm blanking, but yeah. It's also a reckoning with like familial strife, disability, race, all these questions sort of come up in this book. But the thread that ties all of this narrative together is this friendship. And this book made me cry twice. I, She really got me in terms of how she sets up certain things in here. There's one part of this book in which the perspective shifts, which I was really not expecting. And in the audiobook narration, the voice changes all of a sudden. And I just, it, it got me. Um, I will say that. And yeah, this book is just a really excellent plot, well told. And I can't recommend it enough, truly. It was really just a great reading experience that sort of reminded me that I need to not scoff at plot as much as I sometimes do. I, I want to say I feel like I read a lot of books that don't have plot as a focus, but it can be done really, really well. So <laughs> it's a stupid thing to say, but like, I don't know. Plot can be good, y'all. This was a good one. So I recommend this book, definitely. And yeah, that was, that's a wrap on my September reading. Um, I will let you all, well, you'll see the vlog if it ever comes up, but let me know if you would like to see that. And I'm going to try to buy some books this weekend and we'll, we'll see how that goes. But anyways, I will catch you all in the next one. Cheers.